Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, and thank you for joining today's 2020-2022 FOIA Advisory Committee meeting. Before we begin, please ensure that you have opened the chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. Please note all audio lines have been muted, and we are currently recording this conference. You are welcome to submit written questions throughout the meeting, which will be addressed at the Q&A session of the meeting. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, then enter your question in the message box provided and send. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, we turn the meeting over to David Berrio, Archivist of the United States. So please go ahead. Good morning, and welcome to the second meeting of the fourth term of the Freedom of Information Act Advisory Committee. I'm joining you today from 700 Pennsylvania Avenue. Once again, and for the fourth time in 2020, the committee meets virtually as we soon enter our 10th month of physically distancing ourselves from one another. Today, December 10th, marks the 72 years since the United Nations adopted its Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Nearly two decades before Congress passed the Freedom of Information Act, the UN declared in 1948 that everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. That right, the UN declared in Article 19, includes the quote, freedom to speak, receive and impart information and ideas through any media and, and regardless of frontiers, end quote. That freedom is so well enshrined in our American FOIA statute. I'm pleased that the committee will discuss today the intersection between FOIA and classified records, an issue of great importance to the National Archives and ripe for examination by the FOIA Advisory Committee. Bill Fisher of the National Declassification Center here at the National Archives and John Powers of our Information Security Oversight Office, ISOO, are joining us today to give overviews of the work of their offices and how this work relates to government transparency. Over the past 18 months, ISOO has engaged with a diverse group of stakeholders and subject matter experts from federal agencies, Congress, and civil society groups to gather their recommendations on data collection reform. The desired outcome is to end outdated and ineffective data and information collections about information security programs government-wide. This year, despite the pandemic, ISU is piloting a new questionnaire that consolidates and streamlines data collection. That process for reform mirrors the collaborative work that is the hallmark of the FOIA Advisory Committee. I'm also proud of the work of the National Declassification Center, NDC, to systematically declassify records, including last year's culmination of the U.S. Declassification Project for Argentina, the largest government-to-government -government declassification project in United States history. The project resulted in the declassification and release of more than 11,600 records relating to human rights abuses committed in Argentina between 1975 and 1984. While not tied directly to FOIA, this historic release of records affirms the National Archives' commitment to transparency and illustrates how the NDC and ISU bring together people and processes to improve declassification and public access to historical records. As I said at the FOIA Advisory Committee's kickoff meeting in September, much work is ahead for you, but I'm pleased that the committee's four subcommittees looking at national security classification, FOIA process, legislation, and technology have begun work and are charting their course for the next 18 months. Finally, as the hours of daylight grow shorter and time separated from colleagues and loved ones grow longer, I extend best wishes for peace and resilience in this season of light. Please take good care, and stay safe. And I now turn the meeting over to the committee's chairperson, Alina Simo. Thank you so much, David. 
Um, good morning, everyone. As the Director of the Office of Government Information Services, OGIS, and this committee's chairperson, it is my pleasure to also welcome you to the second meeting of our fourth term of the Foot Advisory Committee. I would also like to introduce the committee's designated federal officer, DFO, Kirsten Mitchell, the glue that holds us all together. She's going to help me stay on track today, as she always does, and you'll be hearing from Kirsten shortly with some important updates. Uh, I believe we have everyone joining us today, so I want to welcome all of our committee uh, members. I hope everyone who is joining us today, both on the committee and in our audience, has been staying safe, healthy, and well. Uh, I want to express my gratitude uh, for the committee members' commitment to studying the current FOIA landscape and developing consensus recommendations for improving the administration of FOIA across the federal government particularly under uh, more difficult circumstances of 2020 and unfortunately ongoing into 2021. Um, today, in the interest of time, I would like to dispense with the roll call today and just say a group hello to everyone. Hello. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, all 20 uh, committee members are here today. I also would like to welcome our colleagues and friends from the FOIA community who are watching us today either via WebEx or NARA YouTube. We do have another very busy agenda today, so I will keep my opening remarks brief and do my best to make sure we stay on track so we can end on time. Despite today's ambitious agenda, we will leave time at the end for public comments. We look forward to hearing from any non-committee members uh, who have ideas or comments to share. We will open up the telephone lines for the last 15 minutes of our meeting. And OGIS's Deputy Director, Martha Murphy, will be monitoring the WebEx chat function throughout the meeting. OGIS Attorney Advisor, Sheila Portanovo, will be monitoring the NARA YouTube chat function. So if uh, any one of you have any questions or comments, please feel free to chat them at any time. And you may also submit public comments, suggestions, and feedback at any time by emailing FOIA-advisory-committee at NARA.gov and we will post them to the OGIS website. I have some housekeeping rules before we get started on our substantive meeting. Meeting materials for this term are available on the committee's webpage. Click on the link for the 2020 to 2022 FOIA Advisory Committee on the OGIS website. Please also visit our website today for the agenda for today. We will upload a transcript and video of this meeting as soon as they become available. Members' names, affiliations, and now biographies, we've added those recently, are now posted. Uh, so uh, as I said earlier, I will dispense with a formal roll call, but um, we can report that all 20 of us are accounted for today. Uh, Michael Morrissey, I believe, has just joined us recently. Hopefully his audio is on. Uh, I also just want to let everyone know Alexis Grace has to leave at 12.20 today, so we've agreed to give her the floor first. Um, on part of our agenda since she has to leave a little bit early. So as everyone knows, we've been holding our, our meetings virtually since March. The virtual environment has advantages for many of us, including what we have started uh, to all refer to as business on top and party on the bottom. I'm guilty of that myself today. Um, the disadvantage for me and Kirsten is that we will not be able to see you, the committee members raising your hand or eagerly leaning forward ready to make a comment or ask a question at any given second in time. We're trying our best to monitor all, all faces at all times. Um, so we will be looking for nonverbal cues, um, but we just uh, want to remind everyone to be respectful of one another, try not to speak over each other, although I, re I realize that may be inevitable at times. I want to encourage all committee members to also use the all panelists option from the drop-down menu in the chat function. Uh, if you have a question or would like to make a comment, or you can also chat me or Kirsten directly. We'll be monitoring the chat function. Um, but in order to comply with both the spirit and intent of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, FACA, please be sure to keep your communications in the chat function to housekeeping only, no substantive comment, um, as they will not be recorded in the transcript of the meeting. Also an important reminder, because I am guilty of this myself, if you need to take a break, please do not disconnect from either audio or video uh, web event. Instead, put your phone on mute and close your camera or turn off your camera. Send a quick chat to me and Kirsten to let us know if you'll be gone for more than a few minutes. 
and join us again as soon as you can. Uh, don't do what I normally do, which is I just hang up, and then I have to start the whole cycle all over again. It's very painful. We have noted a 15-minute break at 11.20 on our agenda. We hope that uh, we can keep to that. We'll break a little bit earlier or later, depending on how our pace is going. And also a reminder to all of our committee members, please remember to identify yourself by name and affiliation um, each time you speak. I know it's hard to do that. I myself always forget that as well. I'm trying to remind myself as well, but it helps us tremendously with the transcript and the minutes, both of which are required by the Federal Advisory Committee Act. So before uh, we move on, next I would like to have us look at the meeting minutes for our first meeting from September 10th. We need to approve those minutes from, uh, from that meeting. Kirsten has circulated all of those minutes to the committee members. Um, later today, Kirsten and I will certify the minutes to be accurate and complete, which we are required to do under the Federal Advisory Committee Act within 90 days of our last meeting. So at this time, I do not believe we had any comments or questions or concerns about the minutes from any of the committee members. Kirsten shaking her head no. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes in their current form? Tom, thank this you. Tom, so I want to make my motion. Do I have a oh. second? Even though one is not required, I'll take a second. This is Roger, yes. Thank you, Roger, for your second. Um, all present in person uh, in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Anyone, thank you. Aye. Is anyone opposed? And no one opposed. Um, therefore, the minutes are approved. Thank you. That was very pain painless. Uh, okay, at this time, I am now going to turn the meeting over to Kirsten, uh, who will provide some updates on past committee recommendations. And I'm going to turn to our event producer, Michelle, to ask her to display our dashboard. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alina. This is Kirsten. Um, those of you who watch the FOIA Advisory Committee closely know that since 2016, the committee has made 30 recommendations to the archivist for improving FOIA administration across the government. To help committee members and the public track the status of these recommendations, we created this dashboard tool on the FOIA Advisory Committee page of the OGIS website. Michelle, our event producer, has pulled it up on the screen. Thank you, Michelle. The dashboard provides brief descriptions of each recommendation, actions taken to fulfill each, and links to reports, correspondence, and other related materials. A couple of quick notes. Um, thank you, Michelle. I think you can stop scrolling. Um, for the recommendations marked complete, OGIS and indeed the current FOIA Advisory Committee recognize that opportunities may exist for additional work. Um, for the recommendations not completed, they are marked either in process or pending. The in process recommendations are, we are actively working on, while the pending recommendations we have not formally launched, but expect to do so as early as January 2021. We plan to regularly update the tracker which, um, and keep it up to date. We will also announce big updates on our FOIA Ombudsman blog and on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at FOIA underscore Ombud. Uh, a shout out to my colleague, Crystal Lemelin, who turned this from idea to reality. We think it's a great tool for transparency and accountability it's already made my job easier, um, so I invite everyone to please check it out. Um, we shared it with the committee members um, a, a week or so ago, just before we made it public. So please check it out, but not right now. We're about to hear some interesting information about FOIA and classified records. Um, so I will turn it back over to Alina to introduce our National Archives colleagues, Bill Fisher and John Powers. Over to you, Alina. Kirsten, thanks very much. I really appreciate that. Um, and yes, I really want to thank very much uh, Kirsten and Krista Lemelin and uh, my 
terrific OJA staff who's been putting in a lot of work, and not only on this dashboard, but everything they've done this year. So thank you very much. Um, I am very pleased to welcome my colleagues from two of our, what I like to call sister offices, the National Declassification Center, NDC, and the Information Security Oversight Office, ISU, Bill Fisher and John Powers. I refer to them as our sister offices because ISU, NDC, and OGIS are organizationally all situated under the umbrella of the agency services here at the National Archives. I want to give a shout out to our executive for agency services, Jay Trainer, uh, for his continued support of all of our programs. Uh, William P. Fisher, um, otherwise known as Bill, was appointed director of the National Declassification Center in February 2019. Prior to this appointment, Bill served in a number of positions at the Department of State involving records management, declassification, and other information access programs, most recently having served as the Deputy Director of the Office of Information Programs and Services at the State Department. Prior to joining the Department of State in 2008, he served in a variety of archival roles in NARA from 1998 to 2008, so he'll uh, circle back to his favorite home agency. Uh, he holds a BA in History from the University of Montana, an MA in History from Montana State University, and something I just learned by looking at his bio the other day, a PhD in History from the Catholic University of America. So from now on, we'll, I will be calling him Dr. Fisher. Uh, John Powers serves as the Associate Director for Classification Management at the Information Security Oversight Office, ISU, where he also serves as the Senior Staff Officer for the Interagency Security Classification Appeals Panel. That's a mouthful. The acronym, as we love to have in the government, is ICECAP, and the Public Interest Declassification Board, known as PIDIP. I know John will explain those acronyms in his presentation today. In his 29 years of work at the National Archives, John has served in many roles and positions, almost all focused on declassification, public access to government information, and transparency. A quick personal note, I first met John when I was still working at the Department of Justice, working on the Nixon tapes case, and John was working at the Nixon Project a long time ago. Uh, from 2015 to 2018, he served as the Director of Access and Information Management at the National Security Council. John holds a BA in International Relations from the College of William and Mary and an MA in U.S. History from George Mason University. Both Bill and John uh, will try to stay through the end of the meeting today to answer any questions, but in the event either one of you gets pulled away, gentlemen, please know we will post any questions that we receive and your answers on our website at a later time. So with those introductions, uh, thank you again very much for joining us, and I'm turning it over to you, John. Okay. Can everybody hear me? I hope. Yes. Um, so thank you for having me, Ogis, and welcome to everybody uh, virtually. Um, I'm here today. I'm representing our director, Mark Bradley, who is on a book, a virtual book tour today for his uh, his book uh, that just came out about about a month ago. Um, let me give you a, a little thanks to the OGIS staff for putting this together, and I'll thank you in advance for your comments and questions, and uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to staying throughout the, the meeting today and answer your questions at the end. Um, I am, this is probably the eighth meeting I've done uh, from my bedroom, which happens to be the quietest place in our house uh, with two kids virtually learning, a wife that is also on WebEx, right now, and I also have a very big, do big dog who is barking at a construction crew outside our front door, so uh, hopefully that's not going to interrupt us all. Um, next slide, please. Uh, let's go to the next slide after that. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a history about IQ, first of all. that We, we, we began our, uh, we were created in 1978 under uh, Executive Order 12065 by President Carter. We were initially part of the White House and our, began life in the new Executive Office Building office and then moved to the National Archives in the mid-1980s. We are indeed a very small office. 
with a very large portfolio. And almost all of that is focused on managing government information. We are a little bit unique, though. We receive our policy guidance from the National Security Advisor, um, and we do have work very closely with the National Security Council on matters relating to information security and information management. And in fact, our director is appointed by the Archivist of the United States with the approval of the National Security Advisor, so a unique uh, position there as well. Um, that said, organizationally within the National Archives, like our OGIS, we report to the Executive for Agency Services. Um, I've just put a little bit down here about our organizational structure. Um, we have two directorates, an operations directorate that works on several information security items, including controlled unclassified information, the National Industrial Security Program for contracting agencies, in our state, local, tribal, private sector information sharing program, SLTPS is the acronym for that. Um, and I lead a small directorate called the Classification Management Directorate that I also think has a fairly big um, mission here that includes going out to agencies and reviewing their declassification programs, managing and, and, and doing all of the work associated with the ICAP, the information the Interagency Security Classification Appeals Panel, and also staffing the Public Interest Declassification Board. Um, next up, looks slide. I wanted to give you an idea just of how big our portfolio is. We actually have five executive orders that we either are primarily responsible for or have a role in. The key for all of these, though, is that they are all focused on managing information. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, uh, you're in luck. I'm only going to focus on one small part of that, which is EO 13526, our Classified National Security Information Program. Next slide, please. I put this up just for reference, and, and there will be a few more of these slides that are up here for reference, but I felt that this was important for you all to see, especially some of you who are FOIA folks who may not know about I2, what exactly our mission, vision, and values are. And I'd quickly just draw your attention to our mission statement. That is what we do. We are dedicated to it, uh, all uh, 19 of us on staff. Next slide. Who exactly are our primary responsibilities? Well. Uh, we're responsible for developing and implementing directives. Uh, we work closely with the National Security Council and affected agencies through interagency process. Once executive agency, once, once executive orders are signed, the next item is how to implement them. So give direction to agencies on what they're supposed to do and what those orders mean. So we actually have four uh, implementing directives that we work with every day once they have been uh, been written. The fourth one that's not on here is 32 CFR 2004, which is the National Security Industrial Program. Um, the other big item I'll talk with on this slide is our oversight and inspection role. Although we are smaller than we, uh, than, than we have been, we do try to go out to agencies, look at their program, see what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, uh, try to help them improve their program. That is our overall goal here, I think. It really is to try to help agencies be better. Um, we collect data, and I think uh, uh, the archivist did talk a little bit about that we are in the process of reforming and modernizing the data that we collect from agencies um, in a combination of results from both our oversight on site, our oversight on collecting and analyzing the data, we then report on the results, and we do that in a, a number of different ways, individually with the agency, through our annual report, uh, on our blogs, and also through our IC notice program on our website. Next slide. Um, we have a whole lot of other responsibilities that go with those executive orders which includes kind of, uh, again, I'll focus on, on two here. 
Um, but we do an awful lot of work with every one of these is still very active despite uh, COVID and the pandemic. They are also all virtual, also on WebEx, um, with the exception of the Interagency Security Classification Appeals Panel, which typically meets in a classified environment. We have figured out a way to work in SCIFs and work across to keep our business going. Um, our job there is to serve uh, as the administrative and program support staff. Our director serves as the executive secretary, and we do everything that is related to the panel itself. On the bottom, I'll talk a little bit about the Public Interest Declassification Board, where our director, director also serves as the executive stat, as secretary. That is by statute, and our staff provides all of the administrative and program support for them as well. Uh, next slide. Um, the biggest part of our work, I think, is our oversight role. And going back to what I said earlier, it is really important here. We are all trying to help agencies improve their programs. Uh, in the case of the Classification Management Directorate, we are trying to help them improve the accuracy of their classification and declassification decisions. In the case of our operations directorate, they are trying to help them improve their uh, safeguarding and how they are protecting their classified information. Next slide. I put this mainly up for reference. Um, I'm not sure how many of you deal with classification day in and day out, but there are rules for what you can classify, how, when, what, where, uh, essentially, and that is all spelled out in Section 1 of the Executive Order. So I will uh, leave it at that. On the bottom part of it, though, how we monitor how those agencies are doing with that. We do that through our on-site inspections. We do that through data requests and we analyze their responses. We collect information um, from them every five years through a fundamental classification guidance review process, which we require all agencies to review every one of their classification guides to see if they are still accurate, to see if they are still updated, uh, if they need updating. Um, that process should include not just classifiers, original classifiers and derivative classifiers. It should include users. It should include subject matter experts. And it also typically we ask that it include declassifiers and FOIA professionals as well to give a perspective on what is going on in the FOIA and declassification world that may impact what should or should not go in a updated classification guide. Then the last thing that we do regarding classification is we really do try to help agencies improve their own security education and training programs. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is a reference again for those of you that are not involved in this every day. I just used a government term that can be very confusing, an original classification authority and a derivative classification. Uh, so this is the difference between the two of them. So I'll just, uh, just as for your reference. Next slide. Let me talk a little bit about declassification, uh, which I've spent most of my career working on. And the, the rules for that, what, where, when, how, and why, all are found in section three of the executive order. In this executive order, there are, I put down a few items that are for the very first time were included in the executive order that included that all information was subject to declassification. And importantly for historians, this allowed the president's daily briefs to be reviewed for declassification, which previously the CIA had said they could not be. Um, it allowed for the declassification of artifacts. So there are new declassified artifacts in museums, both at the Air Force, at the CIA, and in other places to showcase some of the work that they've done historically. Um, it did tighten the criteria for exempting information, and it importantly also set limits. So it's something that you, for both that was exempted at 25, those exemptions ended at 50, 
or they ended at 75, depending, and you had to ask for a new request after each certain thresh time threshold. And of course, for Bill, um, it created the National Declassification Center with the goal of trying to uh, bring all of the classification agencies under one roof as they prepare to make records public. And I really think, importantly, one of the things that has been helpful for the Declassification Center, and I'm sure Bill will probably talk a little bit about this here, is one section of the order said uh, was really designed to try to limit unnecessary referrals, something that ISU found in its very early declassification assessments in the late 2000s. So this, this part of the order was really meant to helpfully streamline uh, the, the reviews that were conducted by multi-agency records. Um, I talked a few seconds earlier, we began our declassification assessment program back in 2007. It's been successful. We think that agencies have dramatically improved the quality of their reviews, that they are exempting information they should exempt, they are not exempting information they should not exempt, they are by far not missing embedded equities that they should be referring to other agencies, mostly intelligence agencies. And then the third thing that we've really noticed is that they are definitely limiting the number of referrals. So there are far fewer unnecessary reviewers clogging the National Declassification Center system. Um, that's not to say everything is perfect. The reviews are still pass fail, but certainly we have seen a, a marked difference from that. Um, next slide, please. Now I want to talk a little bit about the ICAP, the, Inter the Interagency Security Classification Appeals Panel. Um, we have four functions. This also is slightly different in, in, from the earlier versions. It first came into being in 1995 or 1994 in the Clinton order and has been a successful mechanism to serve as the final arbiter of what should or should not be classified either if you are requesting a record be declassified through mandatory declassification review or if you are challenging the classification of a record that is inside your agency. Um, the four functions that we have are to be the final authority on classification challenges, and by approving exemptions for declassification at 25, 15, 75 years, that typically means a declassification guide, that we work with agencies, again, every five years. These are required updated. The process has increasingly been much longer than before. They are, again, to account for this 25, 50, and 75-year differences. Um, the last thing I'll say on, on this slide here is, uh, is the bylaws, so the way that we work, the way that the members of this panel work are all codified in 32 CFR 2003, which you can find on the ICAP website, and I'll put that up at the end. Next slide. This is just a reference panel, a reference slide is who sits on the ICAP and who is serves as those final arbitrators. Um, they are high-level officials at all of these agencies. The, the, the two kind of anomalies here are the National Archives sits as a member. It does not have original classification authority, but it certainly has an interest through its National Declassification Center and through the National Archives mission to make government records available. So the, uh, the, uh, the president did give the archives a seat at the table to make decisions. The second thing is that eliminated the CIA as a permanent member of the ICE cap. It only participates in certain instances, and that's when its information is the subject of the appeal. That said, the Director of National Intelligence does have the final say over the intelligence community. That's both in this executive order, and of course, that's where its authority to what kind of lies. Um, next slide. Our activity, well, I, I could go back a lot longer, but I thought I'd just focus on the last three years here. Um, although we have not publicly released the 2020 information, we will do that through our uh, uh, annual report, but I will go ahead and, and give you the, the, the news here. Uh, and let the cat out of the bag. 
But I wanted to talk a little bit about, first I'll start with the declassification, pro declassification guide process. It was significantly longer than the last time. And the liaisons from the agency decided that they wanted to have much more robust declassification guides from the agencies this time around. So they strengthened the language uh, by requiring one, agencies to use standardized language so there wasn't any confusion about what could or could not be exempted and that crossed agencies. We also really tightened the definitions. By we, I mean the ICAP members decided to tighten the language of what you could exempt and for how long. So you would not automatically get a pass at 25 and have the same exemption at 50. If you wanted to exempt at 50 or at 75 years of age, the thresholds were much stronger and they were both in the executive order, but in practice here as well. The other thing for the first time, we recognized that agencies, and this came out of the ISOO analysis part that we had done in the last few years, we noted that agencies were on some occasions had the exact same information and yet they were treating it differently. So the ICAP required those agencies to work together to come up with a joint declassification, a portion of the declassification guide that covered that information so that those agencies were treating the same information the same way. So as you can see, we started this in in 2018, we didn't finish it until towards the end of 2019. Um, and then with the, with the passage of time, a new program came up where we did make an addendum to one guide. Now, I would say what has happened because of COVID um, is we did not get very far on our mandatory declassification appeals. Um, initially, the archives was closed the National Archives was closed all around the country, uh, including at Archives 1, where we are based, and at Archives 2, where the National Declassification Center is based. Most of the agencies we work with were also closed early on and slowly got back up to speed. And it wasn't until August that we kind of figured out how we could work in a classified setting to limit folks' uh, uh, exposure to, to health concerns but still start the process working again. We've already closed from October to December the 10th. We've already quadrupled the number of cases that we have closed in all of 2020. So um, how does this body meet normally uh, outside of a pandemic? Normally, they meet twice a month. They meet for four hours at a time, and they go over cases uh, that way. We've had no classification challenges the last three years, and I may get a question or two about that towards the end. And the other big item, though, that we, we have noticed, and this really started in the early 2000s, or in the late, 2000, late 2000s, um, an exponential increase in our backlog, which went from under 100 cases at the beginning of 2000 to where we stand today of about 1,300. Most of these cases come to the ice cap because one year has passed and the agency has not acted on the request. In contrasting with FOIA, under the Freedom of Information Act, agencies have 20 days to respond. Uh, in NDR, that time frame is extended to a year, and still over 90% of the cases that come to the ice cap come to the ice cap because the agencies have not met the time threshold. Next slide, please. So I wanted to talk a little bit about our annual reports. And I want to talk about our recent ones because they have been different from what we historically have done as a 20 to 30 page report and status update about all of our programs. And we really have, we've shortened them uh, before they are, they are reports to the president. They do go to the president. Um, from being at the National Security Council for three years, I can tell you that they do make their way to the president. Um, we believe very strongly, our director believes, that 
Um, it is time for us to modernize our information management and information security policies and practices. The, all the executive orders leading up to today, they are still based on Cold War practices and policies. Um, that is not how the government operates today. We've said in these last three reports, we think that it's an imperative, both to national security and our democracy. We've said that it's going to require sustained White House leadership. We recognize that any kind of a revolutionary change is going to be very difficult. And we also know that it's going to require significant investments in technology and that those investments are going to have to be closely coordinated across agencies so systems can talk to one another um, and that they are using technology to identify each other's equities, both for classification and declassification. Now, we've also, just as part of that process, like the archivist did mention this, we have started to realize that also the information that we collect is outdated. Uh, and we also were a little unsure of the accuracy. Um, is it really how, how difficult and how, how accurate is it to classify the number of derivative classification decisions when you have multiple electronic formats and agencies using many different classified communications methods to create, disseminate, and use classified information. So we're trying to work with our agencies. We've also gone out to some of the civil society groups to talk a little bit about what metrics are meaningful for agencies. How can, what metrics can we come up with that will help you improve your program? We're working with OMB to figure out how we can include costs that are accurate and actually measure information security programs. And of course, for Congress and for the public, we really do have gone out to say, what's meaningful for you as you conduct and want to look at independently conduct oversight of these programs? So now, I mentioned a few seconds ago that the order does need changing, and there are several challenges that ISU has historically talked about, but certainly in the last few years that we've talked about in our report to the President. But there is a continual challenge of overclassification, despite a strengthened fundamental uh, classification guidance review program. There are still, and that the effect of that overclassification is that it limits information sharing that does have the potential to cause harm to our government. We have noted that while security education and training programs have approved at agencies, there still are compliance issues especially when it comes to original classification authorities who tend to be agency leaders, are very busy. Classification is not their day job. Their mission is their day job, but they still must receive detailed training every year. And almost 85% of agencies that deal with classified information have yet to implement a performance management critical elements in there for their staff that use classification day in and day out. ISU does, the NDC does, but not many other agencies do. And then the last thing I'd say, which is very important, and it, this makes a little bit of sense because declassification programs are, by nature, they're 25 years behind what's going on today. So Bill, pa Bill Fisher is going to talk to you about paper and the challenges of working with multiple equity records in paper because we are still at the dawn of the digital age when it comes to declassification. But very fast, we are going to have an exponential growth of, rec of digital records that are going to need to undergo declassification. And ISU has found that declassification programs across the government are ill-prepared to deal with that onslaught. Next slide. Um, I wanted to switch over and talk to, on another hat here to talk about the Public Interest Declassification Board. It was established by Congress uh, in 2000 as a memorial in tribute to Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Um, it's been re uh, it's been uh, uh, re legislated at least five times 
before of finally becoming a permanent independent board and commission in this year's or last year's National, De National Defense Authorization Act. The functions remain the same. I'm going to focus just on one, which is the, the goal of the board to improve classification, declassification, and public access to government information. During the time that they've been active, although the law was first passed in 2000, first appointments weren't made until 2005, and the board didn't start meeting until the end of 2006. Um, since then, they've written five reports to the president and have engaged in a number of other issues with the White House to help them uh, work on classification matters. Um, at the moment, although they are allotted nine members, we have five. Um, they are Alyssa Starzak, who is our acting chair. Um, they are uh, John Tierney and Trey Gowdy, two former congressmen. Um, Michael um, Lawrence and Ben Powell, who were just appointed by the president. And we still have three presidential vacancies and one congressional vacancy, Senate Ma Majority Leader McConnell. Um, our office, as small as it is, we do provide all of the administrative and logistical support for this board. And uh, Mark Bradley, our director, does serve as the executive secretary. Um, next slide. Now, I did want to talk about the most recent report, and several of you, I think, have probably heard about uh, the report. It was published in, in, in May, late May. We had a public meeting on it in June. It is titled, A Vision for the Digital Age, Modernization of the U.S. National Security Classification and Declassification System. And it really did, it was meant to serve as a roadmap to help agencies overcome antiquated cultures and antiquated policies to uh, design more modern processes and to get the government to think seriously about modernizing the, uh, the system. It decided to put this report into three sections, those recommendations that could have an immediate impact. And you'll note here that one of the uh, recommendations was to empower the NDC. They felt that they really did want the NDC to have more authority, independent authority, especially since they're working with historical records, to, uh, to move the records through the process. Um, the other recommendation is for the, uh, the Secretaries of Defense, Energy, and the Def Office of the Director of National Intelligence, three very big agencies with very big budgets, who are very interested in information security and classified national security information management. And they, uh, the board wanted to direct, have the president direct these folks to work with the Arkansas United States to develop a plan for how to, they can modernize their own classified systems and their records management programs so that once their records do get to the National Archives, it will be far easier for them to re review and declassify their electronic records. Um, the last two are the strategic policy changes. Um, the, the controversial one, they did recognize the importance of having an executive agent. I use the executive agents for, for, for several information uh, security executive orders. So they realized very quickly that it is important to have someone be in charge that in today's world where information seamlessly crosses between agencies, it is imperative that there be standards beyond just the IC, beyond just the Department of Defense, that we needed to branch out beyond the silos, and they really wanted the president to designate an executive agent, and then a steering committee that would help guide the executive agent in implementing a new system with new policies and procedures. Uh, and, of course, the, the last part of the here, I've talked about the importance of transitioning to going for more automated classification and declassification procedures. Uh, next slide. So I wanted to talk, one of the questions I, I heard that you all might be interested in asking had to do about the future. Um, I, I think the reports kind of uh, speak for themselves. 
here. The, the ISU annual reports the last two years, and I will say the next you know, upcoming report, which will cover FY 2019, it will talk about the need for modernization. I'm sorry, FY20. Uh, it will focus on that. It will. It, it really is the executive order. It was revolutionary almost when it when it was signed in 2009. With uh, with some of the changes were very significant. But that order is 11 years old. We don't work that way anymore. The government doesn't work that way. You don't work that way anymore. Electronic communication is our life today. This executive order, the current one, talks about documents. It talks about how you store records in safes. Uh, that is not how we work today. Uh, we need to modernize our policies to match how we work so that we are protecting information we have to, we're disseminating it to those that need it, and we are declassifying it timely so that our citizens can be informed. Uh, so I, 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 I can, again, previewing what will be in the, the next annual report. That will be it. Um, I know this is a FOIA FACA committee. I'm sure that you all are familiar with the uh, uh, Office of the Director of National Intelligence IG FOIA report from 2018. Uh, and it, so the challenges are not just outside the IC. The challenges are also within the IC and that there is a recognition that even within FOIA, which I think is very closely aligned with, with declassification, that there are new policies and processes that they need. They still lack technology and the secure communications that many other folks do. These are going to be essential for whatever happens for the future. And then, of course, I just talked a little bit about uh, what the PIDB thinks about the future and the need for modernization. Um, next slide. The last slide. So I thank you for indulging me for, uh, for the last 25 minutes or so. Um, I wanted to quickly give you a few uh, uh, plugs here. Uh, you can find more information on our website. Uh, if you have not subscribed to our blogs, we have several, uh, including the ISU blog, which we've just started, the CUI blog, which is ongoing and has started long before. I've included a few email addresses and also for the Public Interest Declassification Board. If you want to read their five previous reports to the President, they can all be found on our website. They also have a blog um, that we are robustly, uh, we try to post every week. And we did post today that we are inviting, that the, the members are inviting public comment. What should a new executive order look like? I know that many of the folks in the civil society community have already submitted their report to President Biden, elect, President uh, Biden, uh, the elect, President elect Biden, um, and it does include many of the recommendations from the PIDB, and it does highlight some of the challenges that ISU has put in its recent annual reports. But we really would value your participation. If you have ideas, uh, we're happy to post them on the blog. Please use the blog and uh, uh, that way. If you want to remain private, uh, we also can, can receive your uh, information via our email website. So, so thank you very much for, uh, for listening to me, and hopefully you didn't hear a dog barking or a construction crew going. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Don. We really appreciate it. That's a great uh, presentation. I'm going to now roll it over to Bill. I know there are a few questions from our committee members, and I've asked everyone just to forbear until Bill presents, and then we'll open it up to questions from everyone. Bill, uh, you have the floor. All right, great. Thank you, Alina. And uh, it's always a pleasure to follow John Powers. I think John is probably one of the strongest promoters of declassification and transparency out there. So. Anyway, uh, and I have to also commend that last slide. I don't know if that's uh, an innovation of yours, John, but I haven't seen it before. I like it. So anyway, folks, uh, good morning, and I just want to begin by thanking you for uh, this opportunity to speak today and participate in this meeting. Uh, it's a great opportunity for me to 
share a little bit about the National Declassification Center and the role we play in overall government declassification efforts. So thank you, Alina. Thank you, committee, for extending the invitation. It's a great opportunity. Uh, I also, I just, I want to throw this out there. I thought it was very fitting that uh, John and I, but especially myself, followed the archivist David Ferriero this morning because I'm thinking the National Declassification Center was one of archivist uh, David Ferriero's first acts as archivist uh, almost 11 years ago now. Uh, he, after the executive order was promulgated in December of 2009, one of his first official acts was to establish the NDC on December 30th of 2009. So if you do the math, you can see that uh, earlier in this year, we celebrated our 10th anniversary, and, you know, our, uh, Mr. Ferriero played a key role in that. And then considering that Mr. Ferriero also established this FOIA advisory committee, I thought he provides a great uh, nexus point. It's our common interest in declassification, accountability, transparency. And so I just thought it was very fitting, given the history of both of our entities, organizations, and the archivist. Uh, to be speaking here this morning. So it's a great honor to follow him as well and be able to speak a little bit about this organization that he had such a key role in establishing. Speaking of Executive Order 13526, John covered it very well. I just thought it would be worthwhile mentioning that the vision of the NDC, our motto, our mission is really rooted in EO13526. Uh, our motto, our mission is releasing all we can, protecting what we must. This is what we strive for in our daily activities, in our processes, and in our functions. And it's rooted in the executive order. That's what gives us our marching orders, and it provides our vision. And I think it's worth noting in the preamble to the executive order, uh, it's well stated, so I don't, I can't improve upon it, but it mentions our democratic principles require that the American people be informed of the activities of their government. Nevertheless, throughout our history, the national defense has required that certain information be maintained in confidence in order to protect our citizens, our institutions, so on and so forth. So right there is the vision for the NDC. And that, you can see, uh, is reflected in our mission, which is releasing all we can, protecting what we must. We have this dual function that we uh, strive to fulfill in all of our processes and all of our procedures, and it guides us. It's the guiding principle of our work. It's been the guiding principle of the last 10 years, the first 10 years of the NDC, and it's the guiding principle that's taking us into the future. I would also like to note that the overall mission of the National Archives is the public access to the historically valuable records of the United States government. And the top strategic goal, or the first strategic goal in our strategic plan is making access happen. So as you can tell, the, the vision of the order the mission of the NDC all supports that overall NARA mission of releasing all we can. So when we strive for releasing everything we can and protecting that sliver of information that must remain uh, confidential, we are supporting NARA's overall mission of making access happen. I would also like to point out that, and John uh, alluded to this, that this is not just a NARA enterprise, but this is an overall interagency enterprise that we participate in. And the executive order helps shape that and influence that. So I want to also give credit to our interagency partners who are vital to this process. The NDC would not be able to do what it does. We would not be able to fulfill our mission. We would not be able to release we would not be able to make access happen if it weren't for the 
participation, collaboration, cooperation of interagency partners who are uh, situated with us when we're on site in College Park, as well as the network of contacts we have with agencies. So it's very important to also recognize the role that our partners play in this process because they're vital and uh, we work well together. So with that sort of high level opening here, I think uh, what I'd like to do now is I'll turn to this high level process map. I just threw this out there as a reference to illustrate our process and what we do at a very high level. I like to think of our process as a, we have a macro process and we have a micro process. The top half of the slide really refers to our macro level process and the bottom half refers to our micro level process. But regardless of whether whatever uh, we're talking about, it's still all aimed at releasing all we can, protecting what we must. And it's a quality assurance system. So I'll begin up in the upper left-hand corner in the light green box where it talks about classified records accessioned into NARA. As you probably already know, NARA is the nation's record keeper. So as the nation's record keeper, the role that we play in this is that we are the record keeper, not the custodial unit, but the, but the unit responsible for all of the classified permanent records being accessioned into NARA. Not just one agency, not just one record series from agency, but the whole universe of classified permanent records, which gets to my point about the macro level. We at the NDC and at the National Archives have a responsibility for all of the permanent historically valuable records that are classified that are accessioned into the National Archives. And so we have this responsibility to perform quality control checks and uh, review and protect and release that entire universe of information. So we begin our process with that in mind. And the first thing we do when we receive record transfers, accessions, is to assess the quality of what we're getting because this will de determine how we end up evaluating each particular accession and how quickly it can make it through the process. So this assessment is basically, uh, you know, a review of the documentation, a physical check of the records to make sure and ensure that a proper review was conducted by the originating agency. And very importantly, that the particular review that, or that the particular accession had a valid Kyle Lott review conducted, which relates to nuclear information, RD, FRD. So before we can move on, we must ensure that a valid Kyle Lott review was conducted. In most cases, at this point in time, a particular accession transfer, I'm gonna to refer to it as a D-class project, moves immediately to a sample evaluation for quality control. Uh, it's the rare exception that begins as a page-by-page -page review, and that would only happen if there was not a valid Kyle Lott review conducted, if we discovered some sort of error or problem with this particular project that forced us to conduct another page-by-page -page review of this material, but that's a rare exception. The standard, the norm, is that our evaluation will be a sample of that particular project. I must also point out at this point that this is also an interagency operation at this point. So we partner up with the agencies that are on site in College Park and conduct that sample. If there, if there are no errors discovered for missed equities, that sample project will move on then to the next stage. If there are errors discovered and the errors are widespread and systematic enough for that particular project, unfortunately, it will have to go back for a page-by-page -page review. However, again, that is still the rare exception. Once a project makes it through this evaluation stage for quality control, 
It then goes into a DOE quality assurance review queue. This is a queue established by the Kaya Lot Amendment, and it's how the Department of Energy implements their role in this process to ensure that these records have undergone a proper, thorough review and that there is not an inadvertent release of RD, FRD material. The DOE quality assurance review uh, could also be a sample, an audit of a few records, a few documents, or it could be page by page, depending on the subject matter, uh, the agency, and really what they're looking at there, the, the types of criteria that they would be approaching this from. Once the material makes it through the DOE quality assurance review, it then moves on to the next stage of the process. Uh, it's the box there that says indexing and withdrawal. withdrawal. Uh, I, I like to refer to this as the liberation stage, okay, uh, because this is where, if I use the example of a one-box project, this is the stage where in that one box of records, if there is only one document in that box which continues to be uh, exempt from release, if it's withheld, it has a tab around the document, that one document is removed from the box, set aside, put in a withdrawal box, sent to the classified stack, information about the document is recorded in our tracking and control system, a withdrawal notice is inserted in the box, which serves as sort of the holy grail for requesters in order to be able to identify and find and request that document. Uh, but the other documents in that box, which have gone full through the full D-class evaluation process, are then eligible to be moved to an open stack. They're liberated uh, and allowed to move to an open stack for public access. So this is a very important part of the process. If those documents, uh, uh, those documents that are ready for the public open shelves, they've been declassified, they move to the right. And, however, you will notice that I do have this point about other access uh, restrictions. I don't want to scare you and make it sound like nothing is going to be released. However, I must note that in some series of records, in some documents, in some boxes, some projects, there all are there are also other access restrictions on some of these records. So I just want to uh, make you aware of that. Those could be law enforcement. It could be some sort of statutory exemption. It could be personal privacy. It just depends. Uh, I, that's not necessarily the norm, but I just wanted to make you aware of that. And if there are other types of access restrictions on those records, uh, NARA's FOIA and Special Access staff works with requesters on gaining access to those records. Uh, but at that point, I've washed my hands of this. It's not a declassification declassification issue any longer. It could be some other special access uh, restriction. For records that are withheld during the process, they go to uh, what I'll call the north of that indexing and withdrawal box to our interagency referral center. This is a, uh, an innovation that predated the executive order but was spelled out in the executive order that is another, uh, you know, fantastic interagency operation that we conduct which allows reviewers from other agencies to review documents that were withheld during the automatic declassification process for potential release once they come up in their queue. Uh, at this stage of the game, uh, there's further records end up being released, and those will then be refiled in their original series in open stacks and made available for researchers, and those records that must remain uh, exempt or withheld will be refiled uh, in our classified stacks and withheld, uh, withhold it with the withheld boxes until they come up for release once again. So that's the high-level process for at the macro level for the uh, large-scale 
uh, annual reviews and transfers of classified records. The bottom half of the slide gets at more of the micro level, and this is the access request from the public uh, role here, and how do, does the public, how do researchers get access to individual specific documents that have been withheld. Uh, we have two basic routes, FOIA or MDR, but before I get to that, I just wanted to mention the first box coming out of the chutes is indexing on demand. This is an innovation of the National D-Class Center that allows the public to play a very key role in shaping the decisions about prioritizing what will be indexed and released based on researcher interests and requests. So this is really the part where the public plays a key role in helping to determine what is going to be prioritized for release by the NDC. And I think it's also important to uh, just to mention once again that the reason we build this in after the DOE quality assurance review is because as the nation's record keeper, we at the NDC have a responsibility to ensure the quality of the basic review of all of the classified permanent records coming into the National Archives. We can't neglect this agency or that series of records. Uh, we have to do this for all of the records because uh, we have this responsibility for these records to the American people. However, at the point after it go, the records go through evaluation and DOE quality assurance review, it's a natural breaking point which allows us then to focus on what's of most interest to researchers and requesters so that they can play a role. There is a queue for indexing and withdrawal, and rather than just taking in projects first in, first out, what we do is we annually publish a list of projects that are available for indexing and withdrawal, or indexing on release, on demand, on our website, which allows requesters to visit, scroll through, identify a project of interest to them, which then will shape the ultimate cue for indexing uh, and withdrawal. This allows us to prioritize based on that indexing on demand list. So record projects, D-class projects that uh, have no interest, they will sit on the shelves until there is an IOD request for them or that we get to them in the queue. However, projects that do have researcher interest will get prioritized. Uh, this helps in two ways. The first is that there may only be one document tabbed in that box that must be indexed in order to release, say, 90% of the material in the box. So that accelerates and speeds up what we can get to that particular researcher or requester. And then for the one document that continues to be withheld, we then have the FOIA or MDR route for that particular researcher to request that one document. So it allows us, allows us to get a lot of material out, plus then provide the means for the interested party to request the document of particular interest or documents, whatever it is. So under FOIA and MDR, we work closely again with our interagency partners. Uh, the FOIA MDR shops for our partners are not located in the NDC. These are generally speaking part of an agency's inf overall information access program. So agencies don't have their basic FOIA or MDR shops located within the NDC. So we take documents that are uh, withheld in our holdings and then we consult with the agency that has the equity, which that is the box to the right agency review. When we consult with those agencies, those agencies conduct their line-by-line -line review and they redact, release, whatever the case may be, and they return the results to us 
and then we communicate those results to the requester. Uh, and there it could be denied in full, release in full, release in part, whatever. Uh, but it's a line-by-line -line review conducted, which allows for redactions. So that's our overarching process at a very, very high level. Uh, it, I didn't touch on lots of nuances, say, or details about the process, but I wanted to ensure that you had a good high-level picture of how we fit into the National Archives, the overall scheme of things, the executive order, and uh, also to ensure that you had an understanding of our role in terms of, at the macro level, all of these records, but then at the micro level, trying to get individual uh, records to requesters and researchers. I should also point out that up until this point, we have been really a shop focused on federal records. However, over the last year or two, uh, there's been a change in that, and now the NDC will be responsible for the declassification of presidential records as well. That process of moving classified presidential records to the NDC for declassification was disrupted severely uh, by COVID. We were in the process of moving from collections from various libraries into um, our facility for declass. That was disrupted by COVID, and it's also uh, obviously disrupted our ability to be able to start to process any of those records. However, moving forward, I, I would like to note that the NDC will be responsible for the D-class process at the macro and micro level for the for federal records as well as presidential records. Um, so with that, I'll just, uh, I'll stop here, Alina, and then I'm also available with John for any questions. And again, thank you very much for this opportunity. Bill, thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Um, we already have three committee members very eager to ask you questions. I know we're running up against our break time, so um, let's keep that in mind. Uh, but I definitely want to encourage all of these questions to be asked. It's a great opportunity. Um, Cal McClanahan is first up. Uh, after that, Tuan. And after that, Tom Sussman. That's who's been queued up so far. If anyone else has any questions they want to ask, please chat me and Kirsten James also has a question. James, you're fourth up. All right. Um, Kel, uh, and just to also let everyone know, by the way, James uh, reminded me earlier that he has to jump off at 11.45 a.m. So um, Kirsten, I'm sorry, Kristen Ellis, his co-chair on the subcommittee for classification, will be giving the report out. So um, anyway, with that, uh, Kel, go ahead, please. Well, if James is about to have to jump off soon, why don't we let him ask his question first? That would be wonderful. Thank you, James. Uh, I mean, thank you, Kel. James, do you want to go ahead? Uh, yes, sure, absolutely. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. You can hear me. Okay, good. good. All right, so first, uh, let me say thank you all for the very informative and uh, stimulating presentation. It was a lot of information, but I think it provides a very nice overview of the functions of your of your offices and gives us, gives us a lot to think about as we, we go about our um, our work. I, I have a lot of questions. I'm going to try not to ask them all, uh, but the, I think the um, a couple of things, things that you said uh, really drew my uh, drew my interest. So you you gave some suggestions for the reform of the executive order on classification. Um, I was curious. So who is going to write the new executive order if and when it's uh, rewritten? And then um, another specific, slightly more specific question I wanted to ask related to the tracking of information on classification and, and declassification uh, requests. Uh, I was curious how you track that information and also whether you track information related to the use of GLOMAR exemptions in response to a uh, request for national security information. This is an issue that our uh, subcommittee on classification, classification may uh, look into, and we're interested in gathering information about that. Thank you very much.
Uh, Bill, well, you I might need to Bill. feel that right now because John was all, got kicked off the audio. Uh, yeah, John is calling back in. Okay. Bill, would you mind taking a crack at at least part of uh, James' I'm, I'm back. two-part question? Oh, good. John is back. Although I missed the question, if it was directed towards me. Yes. So, James, sorry, can you summarize? Sure. Uh, so just, just just very quickly. So on the on the executive order, you mentioned uh, uh, that uh, that there is a possibility of it being rewritten. Who will lead that process, and uh, and and how will it work? And then I will ask another question about tracking information about uh, the numbers of classification and declassification requests, and also whether or not you track the use of the Glomar exemption. Okay. Uh, let me take the first one first. All the executive orders in the implementing directors are done through an interagency process that is led by the National Security Council uh, through its normal NSC policy-making process. Um, typically, for this executive order, it's going to involve senior leaders from those agencies that have an interest in this Department of Defense, Office of the Secretary of National, uh, National Intelligence, Department of Energy, Department of State, Justice, FBI, National Archives, ISU. Um, so there, there are a whole lot of folks that will participate in that uh, if and when it does happen. So that process can take anywhere from six months to a year and a half. It depends on how we can, uh, how the interagency process is working its way through. And also the direction that you are given from uh, through the National Security Council structure. So those are a few things. Um, second question had to do with are we tracking the number of declassification decisions? Um, and I'm assuming you're referring to, to mandatory declassification review. Um, the answer is not at the moment. We have completely stopped our kind of data, con data request on that as we start to work through with agencies as to what we think we want to do that will help them improve the program. Uh, talking with civil society groups and stakeholders, this is one of those uh, data points that we do expect to continue. Uh, how many NBR requests do you receive in a year? How many do you complete? How many are carried over? Uh, things like that. On the de automatic declassification front, up until 2017, we were capturing uh, that information as well as the, the uh, uh, NDR information. Um, the third question you asked had to do with are we tracking GLOMARs? We do not. We only track whether, uh, at least at that, up to that point, we were tracking only whether an agency had exempted information, uh, had exempted the record under automatic declassification, or they had declassified their equity uh, or if they had referred it to another agency. That was it. So we do not track in that, to that granularity of a level. Uh, do, do you mind if I follow uh, up and ask whether you think you should be tracking that? I'm sorry if, uh, if someone else is going to respond. My apologies. Well, I, it's certainly something we can kind of take up. Um, so um, I, I guess I haven't seen too many Glomars. The only, the tip of, I mean, I think that you would get – um, it, it is not really a government-wide issue as it is a very specific intelligence community issue, and really that is a CIA issue uh, primarily. Um, I, we, we certainly, I think, will we'll look into it. I, I encourage you to put that up on the, uh, the PIDB's blog as well, so that it's something that, the, that both the PIDB can look at and we can also take a look at and see uh, whether we think it's 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 worth doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, th th thank you very much. I, can I just ask one other question? I'm sorry that I monopolized the before. Uh, so you you mentioned the categories of redacted and formally redacted uh, records, which is an older uh, you know set of set of security classifications as I. I understand it um, that are no longer used. Should these still be around? I mean, uh, would it make sense for there to be legislation or something like that to 
change the classification, would that make your work easier or would that just sort of complicate things? Ah. So the uh, first thing is I did put in the chat for all when Bill mentioned the word FRD and RD. RD and FRD refer specifically to the 1954 Atomic Energy Act as amended, which classifies restricted data as scientific information relating to the development of nuclear weapons, and then removed from that RD category in 1954, that was the amendment, was something that they ended up calling formerly restricted data, which had to do with the application of nuclear weapons, including storage sites, how you actually design the weapon systems to carry a, uh, a nuclear weapon, so a little bit different. Now, the current, if you're talking about the old, old exemption category restricted, um, I would say that the, the, the orders already, in previous orders, actually I want to say the 2003 order or maybe even uh, the, the order from, uh, from uh, Bill Clinton, that eliminated that category and uh, it said that that information was declassified. So uh, if, it's, if it is a restricted category, that information dates back from uh, World War II, and it's already uh, taken care of. The order also does in uh, does talk about OADR, which is originating authority declassification required, which means that you had to go back uh, uh, to, to the originating agency, or you could not determine a declassification date. And all of those also have been superseded by this executive order, which says it doesn't matter how the records are marked. They are all subject to automatic declassification at 25 years unless you have an exemption for it. And even those that are exempted, those that are exempted, their exemptions expire at age 50 unless you've asked for additional permission to extend it beyond that. That may be a little bit too, too detailed for you, but um, I hope that's, that's good. Uh, no, no, thank, thank you very much for, for, for your response, this is James Stoker again. Uh, but uh, I, I was actually referring to the uh, restricted and formal re, re, uh, restricted uh, uh, data, uh, which, you know, my understanding is that uh, they are things that Congress needs, needs to legislate. And so basically what I'm wondering is if the existence of those two categories to deal with nuclear weapons uh, related information, if, if, they, if these are categories that should be effectively changed, in other words, should they just be made top secret or something like that so that they can be dealt with within the, um, you know, the normal channels of declassification, or if that uh, would not necessarily help uh, the, 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 the declassification of information? Well, I, I, I guess uh, I will give John Powers' opinion on this, and Bill, uh, Fisher, please feel free to join in. Uh, it is a law. It's from 1954, very old, heart of the Cold War. Um, especially, the, I mean, it does make some sense to to legislatively protect very specific scientific information. Science is science. It's not going to change over time uh, on the technology, on, on how you build an atomic uh, weapon. And perhaps that is a very good thing that we don't let everybody – uh, C. Now, the category of formerly restricted data, I think just the term itself is very confusing to everybody. Um, I wish that there was a different term that they used. Uh, I know that the Department of Energy has its own implementing regulation, 32 CFR, or 10 CFR, I, I forget the, 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 uh, the, the specific citation, but there are processes within that implementing directive on how the public can request this information be removed from FRD or RD status. Um, I don't know that it is a, that how the Department of Energy has actually worked those processes. I think that there are some reforms that should be uh, helpful in that, uh, in, in trying to modernize the, how one goes about declassifying formerly restricted data, including a new term. This is my view. Um, and I would say that Bill, again, I'll let Bill come in here. When they do the Kyle Lott National, De National Defense Authorization Act Amendment, which happened in 1999, I believe, or 1998, that requires every agency certify 
through that it has reviewed its records with from declassifiers who have passed Department of Energy training that they have certified that there is no RD or FRD in those records. Now, when the QA, the quality assurance takes place, I would think that 95% of the records that were found that were missed, which is still a very, very small percentage, are FRD uh, uh, designations, either that they're marked or they're unmarked. And that is where I think that there probably could be a little bit of uh, uh, discussion about how to reform that. Unfortunately, it's a law. Um, and I would say that, for, that it is very, very difficult to change a law. But uh, that is something that it might be worthwhile to explore. Uh, perhaps Bill uh, Fisher would like to say a quick word or so. So this is Alina. Unfortunately, Bill had some oh. audio difficulties and he's dropped off. Um, he's okay. trying to get back in. So as soon as he's back, okay. um, maybe he'll jump in. Um, so James, okay. are you um, are you satisfied with your questioning? Are you done for now? Or uh, absolutely, and I just want to say thanks to both of the speakers again for for all their work and uh, and, and for coming today. Very great. And, and James, please put that up on the PIDB's blog. I will. Thank you very much. All right, great. So Cal, over to you. <clears throat> Hi, John, and when. If Bill is still watching, hi, Bill. Uh, again, I echo James's uh, thanks for this very uh, educational thing for, for many of the panel members who don't deal with national security information. Uh, I'm sure this was very enlightening. I'm going to sort of do the attorney thing and ask you a question that I already know the answer to, John, simply because it is something that the uh, the classification subcommittee is looking at, and I think that everybody would benefit from a greater explanation and that is, since we are the FOIA subcommittee, we are the FOIA committee, we are dealing with FOIA directly and not as much sort of how to do MDR and how to do declassification. Uh, how does MDR in every agency, not just you know, NARA, handle information that would be protected by a FOIA exemption? What, what's the interaction between those two? Sure. Uh, well, the executive order is very clear on this. Section 3.5C, I believe, um, requires that records that are requested MD, under MDR, the review, the agency review those records for public release, which means that they are reviewing for classification. The records have to be classified in the first instance for them to be a, a mandatory declassification review request. But agencies must also review for the other FOIA categories so that at the very end of this, the requester is getting a, a public release document that has been redacted for, uh, if it has been redacted at all. Um, and I would say that uh, in the past, we, we found out that over 90% of the records that were requested under MDR actually are declassified. So people seem to be getting what they want, uh, at least uh, from, from the more recent past. Um, but if there is a redaction, they are supposed to cite the reasons for those redactions. So it will be the, 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 the typically on MDRs, they will cite the executive order using a 25X category and then numbers one through nine, depending on the reason for the exemption. And if there are any FOIA exemptions, they're supposed to cite the FOIA exemptions that go with it. And if I can just follow up, this is something that we talked to uh, Bill Carpenter way back when, uh, when he had a, a roundtable. If you file an appeal to ISCAP of a decision where they have uh, made a uh, withheld something under FOIA, will ISCAP adjudicate that appeal? So... Perhaps, if it is a recent FOIA exemption, uh, if the requester has, um, uh, there, there are a couple different things. If it's the same requester and the document or the record was exempted or redacted using a B1 exemption, 
in the past two years, if the record has been reviewed in the past two years and it's the same requester, they don't have to, 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 to do it to do it. Um, it it's a time saving uh, thing and, and recognizing that um, uh, agencies are pretty strapped for both FOIA professionals and declassifiers. Um, but that is why at the beginning of this process, you, we, we add requesters must choose either FOIA or MDR. Um, now, uh, what I would say is that uh, the ICAP will not look at other FOIA exemptions. Uh, they are concerned solely with the application of the B1 exemption, the 25X category, or the 50X category, or the 75X category. And are, is it being correctly, was it correctly decided and applied? Um, I'm not quite sure if that answers your question, but maybe that's a start. Uh, it, it, it gets most of the way there. The, the, the point I was trying to get at, and you did explain it, is that if, for instance, you file an MBR request with CIA for something that is an attorney's memo, that they will say, uh, we're not going to grant this under 3.5C because it's covered by the, the attorney-client privilege in the FOIA exemption B-5. If you appeal that to ICAP, ICAP will say, we can't. We we have no jurisdiction to adjudicate the B five. We can only adjudicate the a declassification decision or not. Is that accurate? Correct. That is correct. So they would so on the crazy chance if the the CIA it, using your hypothetical example, the the the, the ice cap will look and will decide if the CIA didn't make that initially case. They will decide what is and what is not classified in that record. Now, um, if uh, it, that would potentially allow the FOIA requester then to use the judicial process for uh, adjudicating that FOIA restriction that is not a B-1. And uh, thank you. And I have one sm small question, and then we can probably go to break uh, if Alina signs off on that. If they okay. get a, a request like that, where it is, it is classified, but it is also exempt under a B-5, we'll say, will the agency process the record for declassification, even if they might not release it for other reasons, so that at least going forward it will be an unclassified privileged document? In my view, the agency should process that, and they should be citing all of their reasons for why they are withholding a record, whether it's Exemption 1 or Exemption 5 or, or other exemptions. Under MDR, certainly if it goes up the field up to the ice cap, they are going to make a decision on whether that record is classified or not. Um, Outside of that, it's the purview of the agency. The other, the other example I'll give you has to do with RD or FRD. RD or FRD information is almost always found uh, within a record that contains other national security classified information that is not RD or FRD. So the Interagency Security Classification Appeals Panel is going to make a decision on all of the information that is not RD or FRD, but it will leave it to the Department of Energy and the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense in the case of FRD to decide uh, how to deal with that information. All right. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. All right. So um, despite what Cal said, we are not able to go to break yet because we have two other esteemed committee members who are queued up to ask questions. Swan, you're up next unless you think questions have already been asked that you were already intending to ask. Yeah, so, so in part, I'll, um, I'll, I'll limit my Please. question here. But um, my question was about uh, Executive Order 13526, uh, uh, Section 5.3C also, uh, which operates as a, sort of an election of remedies. You can get uh, you know, executive MDR process, which while ultimately discretionary, bound by executive standards, it is likely to be more generous than the alternative, or you can get the judicial process that, you know, you could sue uh, under uh, FOIA, but you'll get the court's exemption one jurisprudence, which is, you know, very deferential to the government. And 
and the courts decidedly do not follow the philosophy of releasing all we can, protecting all we must if you go into litigation. So this provision feels uh, a bit punitive. Um, so uh, given MDR and, I and ICE cap appeals have enormous backlogs um, in terms of, uh, you know, President-elect Biden contemplating an order, uh, I wonder if we can't get some change here, perhaps a compromise where a requ requester could could sue without losing uh, executive, uh, uh, you know, ice cap process, provided you've been waiting good faith long enough. Um, I, I wonder if this might uh, sort of at the same time, because we're all interested in sort of disclosing uh, all uh, we can, protecting that what we must, uh, I, I wonder if we might not see some change there. Um, I think that's a very good question. Um, I, I, I hope that you do. Uh, please, please put that forward. Um, uh, I, I, I agree. I, I think ISU's analysis of the agency MDR programs, and I'm sure it does follow what is going on in the FOIA world, too, and that is that um, offices are overwhelmed with priorities. And what I will also say is MDR is an executive order. FOIA is a law. And when we go out to talk to agencies and when the PADB went out to talk to agencies, what they heard is they're going to try to prioritize a little bit the FOIA since there are legal ramifications for non-action or, uh, uh, or adverse decisions. Um, and even then, they're still woefully behind. That is the same with, the, with MDR. They're woefully behind on that, too. Um, how you uh, can get to that with a 1300 plus case backlog and there could be multiple documents or multiple I say documents at the moment because we haven't gotten to electronic records yet in the ice cap um, uh, that, that's a very very good question and uh, I, I certainly uh, uh, putting on my what what the future should hold hat uh, we'd be very interested in hearing your ideas on that so please, please do uh, uh, send those along Thank you. Okay, thanks, Juan. Uh, Tom, are you still with us? And would you I like am. Ask any questions? Thanks. Go ahead. Tom Sussman. Uh, two questions. Uh, we have two subcommittees looking at the issue of training relating to FOIA. Uh, and yet, uh, you had mentioned earlier, John, that training is required for classification, but uh, there's a real compliance problem. And so uh, I'm, I'm wondering if there's a role that the um, advisory committee can play in trying to, if you have some ideas, we don't have to do this now, but uh, how to get some enforceability to the training requirements, which the, the result of um, absence of training is almost always going to be overclassification. I mean, one possibility would be no training within 18 months. It's supposed to be trained every year, no training in 18 months, and you lose your classification authority. Or I'm, I'm sure that there are other ideas one could come up with. So that's that's sort of one issue that I'd like to, to sort of put on the table. The second is there's also a legislation subcommittee of this advisory committee. And uh, I recall during the 70s, the big battle between the Congress when they were considering comprehensive classification legislation, and the executive branch said, no, 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 you can't do that constitutionally. Uh, that's uh, an executive function. Uh, and so I guess this may be a bigger question than uh, you want to address uh, right before the break. Uh, but, you know, what's, uh, what's the role that Congress can play? I mean, should we be even considering recommendations to Congress in the classification area, uh, or is the administration likely to take a historic position that um, uh, we'll do it by executive order and Congress uh, you know, should not intervene? Thank you. Hello, am I on? Yes. Um, it, great questions, and I so so I would say is I cannot speak for the administration. I seem to have lost my audio here, um, but um, I, I'd say I can't speak for the administration. What I would say is that as far as legislation goes. Um, the challenge of undoing legislation seems to be harder than an executive order. 
Uh, and then that's just my personal view. We are still dealing with the effects of a 1954 uh, Atomic Energy Act amendment on RD and FRD information that is a challenge for historians. Uh, and that we hear about at the archives, at ISU, uh, and in the PIDB specifically, uh, almost uh, weekly. Um, the other uh, thing I would say um, is that, so first of all, regarding your training thing, is the executive order does have punitive actions for what happens if you do not receive your training. And or original classification authorities, in theory, at least according to the order, if they have not taken their training, their yearly training, they are supposed to um, lose their, their ability to classified records. That's the, uh, uh, that's, that's the order. It says that already. Now, what ISU has found is that, uh, and not so much for the derivative classifiers, but rather for the OCA, some of those folks that uh, agency head, deputy agency head, the heads of uh, uh, assistant secretary, undersecretary level, who are typically the, the three-star generals, those folks are usually quite busy. And we do have concerns about the quality of the training that they receive, that they are perhaps done too quick, they're not as detailed as they should be. Um, that said, we also are not really staffed to go out at, at, to every single OCA, and even though that there are far fewer OCAs today than there were 10 years ago, and that's a good thing, uh, we think, um, uh, we don't have quite the, the staffing to go out and do that. We do offer kind of uh, template slide decks for uh, the, the person who is responsible for an agency um, information security program, the senior agency official who's responsible for the program, that they can use the training that we have uh, and just kind of modify it to fit their agency. Um, whether or not that actually happens, that's the question. The derivative club declassifiers, we feel pretty good about the training that they receive. But the original ones, we're not quite so sure based on some of the, the few interviews when we were going out to agencies and actually doing on-site inspections, and part of our process included an interview with one or two OCAs, and one of the questions we'd ask is, when did you do your training? Uh, and if the answer was, I don't know, then, then we knew that we had a corrective action and a finding to, to put in our, in our response. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question or, or not, maybe perhaps a little bit, and I'm happy to kind of continue this discussion uh, uh, either through your subcommittees or, or otherwise, too. Tom, you're good? Oh, I'm back on. All right. Um, I think uh, Tom just gave me a thumbs up, so thank you. Um, it could very well be that Bill Fisher has rejoined us on audio, but we're going to give him a little bit of a break. Uh, what we may call on him to do is revisit some of the questions that were posed today, all of the questions that were posed today by all of our committee members and ask whether he has anything to add to John's uh, great answers. John, thank you so much for hanging in there with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, let's all take a 15 minute break. I know we're a little behind schedule, actually way behind schedule. Um, so let's all try to come back at noon. Uh, can I give you a 10 minute break instead of 15 minutes? That would be really great. Um, and uh, we'll continue our, our great meeting that we're having. So everyone, 10 minute break, uh, please come back at noon. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, Michelle, I just want to make sure we're back online, we're recording, and our audience is watching us. Can you confirm that, please? Yep, we are all set. Okay. Well, thanks. I'm sorry to have given everyone a really short break. You know you can run away from the computer anytime you need to. Um, but I appreciate the fact that everyone's hanging in there. Uh, Bill, thank you so much for your participation. We know you had to drop off a little bit. So we are going to grill you with all the questions that were asked and, and ask of you if there's anything you want to add um, later after the meeting. And we'll post any additional thoughts you have to tack on to John Powers' uh, great answer. So you're not off the hook entirely. But um, thank you, and I'm sorry if you have technical problems. So uh, at this point in our meeting, I would like to turn to the part of our agenda where we hear on the progress of each of our four subcommittees. I am extremely grateful to all four subcommittees. Um, none of them have wasted any time since our last meeting. Everyone has rolled up their sleeves and started digging in to figure out mission and direction. So thank you very much for that. Um, I did suggest at our first, and our first meeting back in September that each subcommittee focus on a mission statement of some sort that may help move uh, the ball forward. I understand that although some of those mission statements are ready, some are still in progress. So as soon as all four subcommittees are ready for prime time, uh, we will post them all on our website. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but I'm excited to hear from all four subcommittees. I think the committee will hear all the great work that's been going on. I know some of the committee members are on multiple subcommittees, which I think is actually a great benefit because they can lend their voice to things that they're hearing um, that's going on in each of the various subcommittees. So I really want to encourage that. Tuan, it's still not too late for you to join the classification subcommittee. That's my pitch. Um, so over to Kristen Ellis, unfortunately, James Stoker, who is our uh, co-chair on the classification subcommittee, had to sign off. But Kristen is going to carry um, the weight today. So Kristen, over to you. Thank you, Alina. Um, hi, everyone. So. As Alina said, James and I are the co-chairs of the classification subcommittee, um, and James had to drop off, so he's left me in charge, and that may be dangerous. Um, the classification subcommittee has drafted a mission statement. Um, as Alina said, I think that since everyone is not ready for prime time, they haven't been posted yet. As a general proposition, the classification subcommittee is planning to investigate the role of classification in the FOIA process. Um, certainly, the classification of information is critical to national security, but as both John and Bill talked about earlier, it can impose obstacles to the public's <clears throat> ability to access certain information. And so we are going to explore that in a lot of different fashions, we think, um, during this term. To that end, our most recent discussions have focused on possible priorities for the subcommittee to work on, and we came up with a list of seven potential priorities. Right now, the subcommittee is four people, me, James, Kel, and Lubna, and so we have limited resources, limited time to explore all seven, at least at once. So we decided to try to prioritize um, the priority list. and determined that we could work on a couple of items at a time, and maybe at the end of this, we will have touched all seven, or we will have um, really touched on an issue with just focusing on one or two that really uh, we think are critical to this work, so maybe we'll only get to two of them. Uh, to that end, we identified that we also considered that it might make sense to have a more broad, longer term item that we work on and then smaller, more concrete, more time limited items that we could get due out on more quickly that may inform the bigger process. So we went through our list of seven potential things and came up with two that we want to focus on initially, um, one concrete, one more broad. And the concrete item is um, how GLOMAR responses are administered across the government. And for folks that don't work too much in the classification area in FOIA, a GLOMAR response is basically just 
uh, an agency refusing to confirm or deny whether the responsive records exist. Um, the Glomar was actually a classified CIA ship, and there was a case about that, which resulted in it being called Glomar. Um, so we want to focus on how Glomars are administered in the government, and is there any sort of consistency across the agencies regarding use, which there may not be because different agencies have different um, reasons for invoking a Glomar? As I think the presentations earlier today and Kel's question to uh, John, I believe, indicate it seems that it's a data point that's not being collected right now in the government. So this is largely going to be a research item to see if we can get our hands around um, the use of GLOMAR and how it's being used and the extent to which it's being used in the government. And then the second item, the more broad, longer term, we think, item, is how agencies can proactively declassify documents to better meet the concerns of the requester community. So again, I think this dovetails a lot with what John and Bill were talking about, um, but how can, is there a way, how is there a way to make information more accessible um, proactively versus through the MDR process or through the FOIA process? Um, so that one is broader and is probably gonna require a number of different avenues to figure out if there's a way to accomplish that. Um, so our next subcommittee meeting is after the holidays, and we will, you know, continue the work and discussions. We're at very early stages of all of this, so um, my, my time here is short. That's pretty much all I have to report out from the uh, subcommittee activity so far, um, unless somebody has questions or Alina, Kirsten, if you need me to address anything else. I'm certainly very good. I just want to ask your uh, subcommittee members, Cal, uh, Lubna, anything you, is there, either one of you would like to add? This is Lubna, nothing to add. Uh, well stated, Kristen, thank you. Thanks, Lubna. And okay. Cal, I hope that thumbs down was not, I just completely screwed that up, but that you're good. Right? No, I'm good. I, I have lots of things to add later, but not today. <laughs> okay. The work continues. Thank you so much, Krista, for that report. Uh, Michelle, next slide, please. Uh, the next uh, subcommittee that's going to report for us is the uh, process subcommittee. Uh, the co-chairs are Linda Fry and Michael Morrissey. And Linda and Michael, I don't know which one of you is going to present, so I'll let you take it from here. Um, I can go ahead and, and present. Um, basically, we have been meeting every other week. And um, at this point, we've started on our mission statement, but I don't know that it's 100% finalized yet. And we've identified eight uh, recommendations from the prior committees that we want to further explore and see um, the likelihood or difficulty in trying to get some more of these implemented to help um, help the FOIA process flow. Um, Michael, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that that covers it. I could, I have a draft of our uh, mission statement that was still sort of a working, working mission statement so far. Um, but I think, uh, I'll just go through it. A well-functioning system of public records is a cornerstone of informed democracy. And so this subcommittee examines the current FOIA processes as a mason would their tools. In order to further improve our field, we'll identify how prior recommendations have and have not had their intended impact, highlighting both successful pilots and progress while noting blockers and impediments to progress. We'll also look as holistically at how we can build a shared understanding of FOIA's purpose and process, which brings together the goals of the requester and the processing communities, as well as identify applicable inspiration from state and international practice. We'll pay particularly close attention to the FOIA process through three particular lenses, the use and adoption of technology, the independence and impartiality of the process, and structural incentives to set the groundwork for lasting improvements for the field. So I think that has the word process about 50 times in it, but um, I guess that's relevant for our committee. 
Okay, Michael, thanks very much. And Linda, thanks very much. Um, any process subcommittee members have anything to add? I just want to personally say thank you um, to the process subcommittee for taking on this probably not so thankful task of looking back to prior recommendations. Um, on behalf of OGIS, we are very grateful for that for that help. I think that's you know very, very um, valiant of you and, and very much appreciated. So thank you. All right. So uh, not hearing nothing else from anyone on process, if we could go to the next slide, Michelle, please. I uh, invite now the technology subcommittee co-chairs to present and let us know what they've been up to. Allison Dietrich and Jason Gart are our co-chairs. Allison and Jason, I don't know who's going to go first, or I'll let you guys figure it out. I, this is Allison. I'm going to go first. So we've uh, finished our mission statement, vision statement, and we're going to be exploring the applicability of technology-driven solutions to improve and streamline the FOIA process as well as review prior uh, advisory committee recommendations. So we're currently in the process of going through the technology aspects of the prior committee's um, work and seeing which ones that we think we can take the next, to the next step, which ones we can add to and fully execute, as well as seeing what new priorities um, and goals that our group has. And we're looking to do both short-term and long-term impacts as well. Jason, do you have anything to add? No, that covers it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I, I do want to note that um, the Technology Subcommittee has been coordinating with the Technology Committee of the Chief Way Officers Council, so we're trying very hard not to overlap. Um, but there are so many issues that uh, need to be looked at. So. Uh, again, I'm also very grateful for your work and trying to follow up on recommendations from the past uh, committee terms that we've had. So thank you for that. Anyone else on the technology subcommittee have anything to add or anyone on the committee have any questions? I'm seeing a lot of no's. Okay. Um, okay, so moving on, last but not least, uh, turning next slide, Michelle, please to Patricia West and Cal McClanahan, our subcommittee co-chairs for the legislation subcommittee. And I'm asking that as a question mark. Are you legislative or legislation? I just want to clarify. That's a good question. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure. I think, legislative, I think legislative is better, uh, okay. but that's what I'm kind of thinking through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Legislative sounds good. And Kel, um, you said you were going to go ahead and present. So over to you, please. So uh, our committee, or our subcommittee, is a little bit of an odd duck here where we're more of an operational uh, approach to rather than being a particular subject matter like technology or process or something like that. We're looking at issues that, you know, we have decided are particularly ripe or uh, susceptible to legislative fixes, to legislative reform, or even to exploration to see if legislative reform is necessary. Uh, we originally had 13 items that we went through. Some of them were from old recommendations. Some of them were from old, were from recommendations from other committee members, and narrowed it down to four. We don't really have a not even ready for prime time. We don't have a ready for the midnight show mission statement yet because we decided because of sort of the nature of our subcommittee, uh, we are making six month plans basically. And so what we are talking about now, what I'm talking about now is what we're planning on doing for the next six months. And then we're going to do a whole new six month plan that may be something completely different or may carry over some matters. So we voted on all 13. We had a lengthy discussion of them, and we settled on four topics that are relatively briefly uh, expanding FOIA or some FOIA-like process to certain parts of the legislative and judicial branches like GAO or Capitol Police or Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, 
uh, in the greater inter interest of greater transparency to those agency-like entities that would be amenable to that kind of uh, transparency. Uh, finding ways to improve uh, and give greater authority to uh, and in all ways make OGIS more effective, more um, resilient, nimble, able to sort of do the things that those of us who were here when OGIS were created sort of envisioned for OGIS to do uh, to address that bugaboo funding, you know, appropriations, getting money for FOIA offices or for FOIA programs or finding ways to make more bang for your buck in FOIA programs so that if you don't get more money, at least you can do more with it. And the last one is another perpetual argument, how, how to improve fee, fees. How, how do agencies assess fees? How do they charge them? How do they use them? Should they have them? If they should, should they be uniform, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all, all things fee related. Those are basically our four topics that we're going to look into, hopefully have something done on at least all of, uh, on at least a few of them, if not all of them, come six months from now, and then we will recalibrate and decide where to go from there. And I'm good. Unless anyone has questions or Patricia wants to say something. Um, I'll, I'll just follow up and, and say, um, as, as Cal mentioned, those are our four uh, working groups. Um, expanding the scope of FOIA, strengthening OGIS, FOIA funding, and FOIA fees. Um, shameless plug, if any of these sound of interest to you and you would like to join our subcommittee and these working groups, um, you know, the water's warm, so jump right in. Thanks, Patricia. Perfect plug. I really appreciate that. <laughs> And thanks, Kel, for the presentation. I just want to, I'm looking at everyone. Does anyone have any questions for any of the subcommittee co-chairs before we move on? I'm seeing no one jumping up and down. Okay. Uh, so at 1220, we were supposed to lose Alexis, and I'm hoping maybe I can catch her for five minutes, um, and we're Unfortunately, a little behind schedule today, and I'm going to have to just cut short a part of our agenda. But since it's a very, very important topic, I really would like to say that uh, I'd like to get it started today and continue and carry it over to uh, March when our next meeting occurs, because unfortunately, whether we like it or not, the pandemic continues to stay with us. Um, so just a, a quick couple remarks, and then I'm just gonna turn the floor over to Alexis when this year began, I don't think any one of us could have imagined the year unfolding the way it has. Um, and we all know that COVID-19 has had a profound effect on all of our lives. But in particular today, uh, I wanted to just focus our discussion among our committee members uh, so we can learn more from each other about how the pandemic has impacted the FOIA process at federal agencies and how in turn that has translated to the requester community. Uh, we know that on March 17, 2020, OPM ordered maximum telework flexibility across the federal government. Um, the move to a full-time work from home environment affected a lot of FOIA um, offices, um, especially in the intelligence community. Um, OGIS found itself in a unique position to observe FOIA administration across the government. So we published a quick review of that. Um, we looked at how agencies were informing FOIA requesters about what was happening as a result of the pandemic, uh, a snapshot between May 15th and June 9th of 2020. And in the midst of that review, um, kudos to OIP. Um, OIP issued their guidance for agency FOIA administration in light of COVID-19 impacts on May 28th, 2020. And um, it stressed four important things. FOIA statutory time limits remain unchanged. Requesters, I'm sure, wanted to hear that. Uh, importance of clear and effective communication with requesters, encouraging agencies to make proactive disclosures, and leveraging technology to maximize efficiency. Um, just a, a shameless plug for OGIS, we're actually going to undertake another review of agency websites, um, and we hope to publish another uh, quick snapshot in time report in the near future. 
So um, with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Alexis. Maybe she could share with us a few things that have been going on at her agency before she has to jump off. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Um, so we immediately put a notice banner on our landing page, um, which I think was very helpful for requesters. Um, you know, we, of course, encouraged um, electronic submissions uh, to the extent possible um, in lieu of mail and fax. Um, we also encourage people to consider outscoping those portions of the request that are asking for hard copy records. Uh, with the understanding, of course, that many people were, of course, teleworking and unable to do or perform those searches. Um, so we have found that requesters, uh, requester community has been very amenable, actually, um, to outscoping portions of their requests, of course, uh, with the caveat they will come back uh, once the pandemic is over to request those other portions. Um, but I think the majority of our records are electronic now, um, so most of what they're asking for can be access um, through those electronic searches. Um, one of the big things uh, for us initially uh, was staffing, and I'm sure this hit every agency, but, um, you know, we really had to think about core hours and how we do schedules for our analysts. Um, you know, everybody has families, um, and so we wanted to make sure that we were uh, being mindful of that. And so um, we actually extended our core hours, and so we were also very flexible with our schedules. Uh, you know, we have some folks who will work a few hours in the morning, take a midday break, and then work in the evening. So, you know, we have folks working as early as 5.30, 6 a.m., and they might conclude their day at 7. Um, so once that flexibility was afforded um, and approved by our general counsel, I think that we began to, you know, see that uh, continuity of operations again. Um, one of the things uh, that we are still trying to uh, figure out or resolve is the idea of these checks. And so uh, to the extent that we can waive these, we have been doing so. Um, but again, you know, that does require someone to come into the office. And so we've been kind of just round robbing the idea of folks coming into the office to pick up checks, look for checks, um, and making sure that those get off to the Treasury. Um, again, we are looking for solutions to um, expedite that process. Um, overall, I found that, uh, you know, our, our agency and the types of records, I, I, we are one of the fortunate ones. We don't have a lot of classified records. Um, so it really lended itself to uh, telework. And I am actually pleased to report, um, despite all of the challenges this year, um, we recently had a realignment where our staff offices were realigned under our Office of General Counsel. And all of our staff offices this year, despite the challenges, uh, realized reductions in um, the backlog. So I'm very pleased and proud of that. Um, but again, I think this, you know, uh, has us starting to think about how we do our business operations and what's the most effective. Okay, Alexis, thanks. That was really helpful. Um, do you need to jump off or um, yes, can you stay? Yes, I will need to jump off. Okay. Thank you so much. Happy holidays, and thank, thank you. you for sharing all of that. Thank you. Um, so initially, thank you. Initially, I was going to ask Roger to kick us off, but um, I gave Alexis the force that she had to leave. But Roger, would you like to share with us a little bit about what's going on at the CDC, um, especially because I'm sure you are um, under a lot of scrutiny. A lot of requesters want records um, sure. about what's going on at the CDC, especially during the pandemic. Sure. Thank you, Elena. Good morning. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, we've done a couple of things. Um, I think one, we we did provide some updates to our website in basically encouraging requesters to submit their requests electronically um, because we have basically two avenues by which they can submit their requests, uh, and it's entered into our system, and so it's a much more efficient way to do so. We discouraged, uh, we basically said that, you know, don't submit requests by mail because there's no one there to pick it up. Uh, we still have had quite a few come in, not that, that, not that many. And so we have um, one of our staff members who goes, I think for the first six or seven months, we had no one go to the office. Uh, but we recently had a student intern come on board, and he has caught up with all the snail mail in the office, so we'll be able to handle that. Uh, we should also be able to work uh, find a solution to getting payments for fees electronically so that people don't have to send in checks. Um, but the reality is we, we 
very rarely charging fees anyway, and so that is not really a big issue for us. Uh, we certainly have seen, uh, because of the role CDC is playing in the pandemic, uh, we, we've seen a significant increase in our FOIA request for 2020, FY20. Um, CDC typically averages around 1,100, 1,200 requests. And for the first time in, in FY20, we ended up with very close to 2,500 requests. So that's that's close to 100% increase in our in, in our in the number of four requests that we receive. And the vast majority of the requests that we work on are related to COVID. So basically, we are the COVID processing agency for the age, for the for the nation. Basically, all the requests, the majority of the requests that we get are it's everything all about COVID. And um, most of the requests that we receive are also complex in nature because all these COVID records involve multiple agencies um, and the White House. And so processing the documents and, and, and getting them out the door has not been as prompt and as timely as we would like. Um, we've seen an increase in our VOIA backlog um, from a low of less than 20 in, at the end of FY19 to somewhere in the region of over 300, which is something that we don't want to see, uh, but we're working um, to try and get it down. But we certainly have um, changed um, some of our processes to make sure that we can much more efficiently move cases along. Um, I think around June, um, I'll leave I can speak to this, uh, CDC engaged with OGIS so that we can engage with our, no, before to engage with our requesters, and we had, I think, close to 100 um, participants from uh, both from the requester community, uh, reporters, and just members of the general public to give them an opportunity to hear from CDC what we're doing with regard to uh, handling COVID requests and how they could help us help them. A and I could say that I think since that webinar, we've seen a change in our communication and the willingness of requesters to work with CDC in terms of providing responses to our request, uh, they are much more um, willing to work with us, and that has been very helpful. We've also seen an, an, a dramatic, dramatic increase in the use of technology uh, to assist us in, in looking for documents. Uh, before FY20, I think probably only about 15, maybe 20 percent of our FOIA requests were conducted by the FOIA office. Most of the sites were conducted by custodians. Um, but as of, the end, as of early November, over 7,000 CDC staff assisting assistant with, the, with, the, with the response, which means that we don't have the luxury of going to custodians and asking them to assist with sites for documents. So uh, fortunately, because we had um, eDiscovery tools available, it has certainly helped us ramp up uh, utilizing that e-discovery to search for documents, and certainly that has definitely helped us out a lot because without that, I think we'd be completely buried. Uh, we've definitely had our staffing issues, um, but we've managed to secure some COVID resources for two, two term employees who are going to be with us up to four years, and that has certainly helped. Um, we recruited a student intern to help us with initial intake, and that also has been helpful, uh, and we are working to see if we can get a contract in place uh, to assist us with um, processing for a request that we can move these cases out quickly. Uh, and lastly, what I want to say is that as a result of, you know, as our inability to respond to for requests timely, especially this COVID, we've seen an increase in our litigation cases, and therefore that's another thing that we have to deal with. That, Hopefully, I think that we have gone to a much better place now, that we have a much better process in place, and we're moving in the right direction that I, I think that, you know, a year from now will be a much better place than we are right now in terms of timeliness of responses to requests, refining our processes even better, communicating with requesters even better, um, providing a lot more interim responses to foreign requesters, and, and asking them whether that will be enough to to close that request, especially if some of the other records that they're waiting for might involve, for example, UP documents. Um, hopefully, we think that some requests might go, you know what, 
what you've given up is enough and would would be willing to to close that request. If anybody has any questions or uh, now at any point, I'll be happy to answer. All right, Roger. Thank you so much. That's sure. really helpful. Um, so uh, to be fair and balanced, I want to look to uh, our committee members who are on the requester side. That is the beauty of this committee, that we have a balance of, of, of both. Um, anyone on the requester side want to weigh in about their experiences during COVID? Uh, Mr. McClanahan. So uh, I, I have actually been asked by a couple of different people to mention the experiences of various litigants and various requesters with, with various agencies that sort of go across the agency or across multiple agencies to find out how widespread this is. Uh, one of the big ones that we have experienced is the agencies that will sort of do the rotating staff or they'll have staff come in on certain days or even certain weeks or, you know, the people who can't come in don't come in because they're either sick or they have to stay at home or something like that. They might not be able to work with classified information. But uh, some agencies are still keeping the, what I'll call assignment cues, where let's say that Alina Simo is a FOIA officer and she is in charge of my request. If she stays home, my request goes into a general pool that people won't look at until they're done with all the requests that they're already assigned. And so requesters are getting basically sidelined or thrown to the side by complete accident, uh, simply because the FOIA analyst that's handling their request isn't there that week or that month or can't access classified records or something like that. So that is one concern I've heard from some people, the other concerns that sound like they're going away, uh, so I'd like someone like Lubna or Christian to sort of talk about this when they get around to it, is when you're talking about classified records, you know, and you're talking about a lot of agencies had problems with work from home analysts not being able to see classified records. You know, that appears from the outside to be less of a problem than it was maybe six months ago but I would like someone who actually works in an intel or law enforcement agency to talk about that and how they're fixing that problem. Okay, um, great question, Kel. Um, I don't want to put Luke now or Krista on the spot, but would love to hear from your perspective what's happening on your end. Hey, uh, this is Lubna. Um, I'm happy to speak to that. Um, Obviously, I think I think Kel's comment is, is spot on, which is it's less of a problem now than it was six, seven, you know, eight months ago. Um, with regards to, to DIA, you know, um, that's been one of the biggest uh, problems that we've had to try to tackle in terms of dealing with FOIA requests is that um, most of the information that people are, requ you know, requesters are seeking are on the classified systems, but we have had a significant portion of our FOIA specialists um, at home teleworking for a variety of different reasons. You know, we're dealing with situations of folks who have self-certified as high risk, and the agency has a policy in terms of how we deal with that. Then we're dealing with also trying to accommodate um, folks who have families at home, kids at home who are working and trying to figure out how to use, you know, balance telework with mission. Um, and, um, and then we also are certain restrictions in terms of um, the agency's reconstitution plan and the, the, the percentage of employees who can actually be physically on site. So those have all, you know, kind of evolved over the, the last couple of months where we're, we're better now, the FOIA office is in a better posture now in terms of at least being able to have um, a certain amount of people in the office um, every single day, but obviously we're, it, they're not anywhere up to 100% uh, full operating capacity, um, and that's just consistent with the agency's reconstitution plan. 
um, in terms of how to keep uh, the workforce uh, uh, safe um, and, and the safety protocols that we have in place. So it continues to be a challenge, um, but I think it is less of a challenge than it was at the beginning when we had a, you know, almost a majority of folks on telework. But um, given the nature of the, do the documents that we work with, um, you know, not being able to have everybody in the office all the time is going to necessarily impact the ability to process um, with the same, um, with the same, you know, speed or uh, and, and efficiency that we did before. And then again, as an all-source intelligence agency, we also work very closely with other agencies because most of the records that we have contain other agency um, equities and those agencies have their own limitations, so that just kind of builds uh, on top of it. Um, I know that we've made some efforts to try to improve upon the type of work that the folks that are teleworking can do in terms of, you know, intake processing, um, you know, initial responses, communications with the requesters, you know, things that we are able to try to can do from telework, uh, the agency is working uh, to allow the FOIA specialists to be able to do that, um, and hopefully that will help us to become a little bit more, more efficient. Um, hopefully that answers Kel's question. Over. Great, thank you so much. Um, Kristen, do you want to talk a little bit about what's going on in your neck of the woods? That would really be helpful. Sure. Um, so I violated Alina's rule at the beginning. Uh, I'm Kristen Ellis, and I'm at the FBI. Um, we, I think consistent with, with sort of Luna's experience, it's less of an issue for us right now. Um, but I will say that as of Monday, the FBI's FOIA shop has dialed back to a 50% capacity because of impacts from COVID. Um, starting in April, we had gone back 100%, and um, we've had to dial that back. You know, the challenge for all of this, for anybody that works in an agency that works on classified systems, is that our systems are typically built around the classified system because it can handle everything. Um, it can handle unclassified as well as classified, whereas the unclassified system can only handle unclassified. So our, the full portal, while you can submit an electronic request, it gets routed ultimately through to the classified system. Our FOIA document processing system is on the classified system. The vast majority of what we do evolves from a classified system. And for security reasons, we can't just downdraft that information, even if we believe it's unclassified, to work on an unclassified system with it, because that risk spills of classified information that is not immediately identifiable in the document. So basically from our perspective, this all drives around people and the ability of people to physically be in an office, um, which has been obviously for pandemic purposes, the major impediment. We're continuing to work through this. Our FOIA office is continuing to explore whether there are technological solutions to any of this. And if so, if they're feasible in terms of purchasing technology, implementing technology, getting it through security protocols and all of that. Um, we're just doing our best to continue the flow of the work. From our perspective, we also hate being shut down because we already were in the hole in terms of a backlog. Not working makes that backlog worse and we don't want a worse backlog. Um, as I think Roger was talking about CDC's litigation load going up, um, FBI definitely was already very, very high, and adding to it doesn't help anybody. So we're trying to be creative in solutions, but our, our hands are very much tied just because of the security aspects of it. We're continuing to try to get as many pages out to as many people every month as possible. Um, but I think that this is a long-term government-wide 
problem that needs to be addressed because I think most of us were caught on our heels when we couldn't go to work. We have continuity of operations plans, but a lot of those are based on folks in DC not being able to work, but maybe folks in California being able to work. The problem was nobody could go to the office, and so we didn't have backup, and we didn't really have a great plan for how to work that when all of us work on classified systems in the FBI, um, generally speaking. So, I mean, I think that that's not a great answer, but that's sort of where we're at right now is we shut down, our FOIA shop shut down completely in March for about six weeks. It then went back online in varying degrees. We're now dialing it back because of the amount of infection and exposure that we're experiencing. And I think that we're gonna continue to see the up and down in the ebb and flow until we get the situation with the pandemic under control. Okay, thanks, Krista. So um, I'm looking at our time, and I know that there's a lot of other folks that would love to talk about this topic. Um, and I, I would like to ask for the rest of the committee members to defer and save their thoughts for our next meeting. I really would like to continue this discussion. I think it's a very important one and, um, and hope that all of you agree. Um, but I also want to end this meeting on time today. So we are at 12.43 p.m. And at this point, I thought I would turn to the public comment section of our meeting, if that's okay with everyone. Okay, I'm seeing some nods. Thank you, Dave, for nodding. Um, so uh, at this point, we are, um, we have now reached the public comments part of our committee meeting, and we do look forward to hearing from any non-committee participants who have ideas or comments to share. Uh, just a reminder, we have posted and we will continue to post on the FOIA Advisory Committee webpage on the OGIS website any written comments we receive. Any oral comments are captured in this transcript of the meeting, and we will post those as soon as they are available. Um, Michelle, our event producer, if I could ask you to please open up our telephone lines and provide instructions, that would be great. Absolutely. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to make a public comment over the phone line, please press pound 2 on your telephone keypad to enter the comment queue. Once again, pressing pound 2 will enter you into the queue. Okay, and at this time, do we have any calls online? Anyone want to ask any questions through? Okay. I do. I do see one person on the uh, on the phone who'd like to ask a question. Okay. Caller, your line is unmuted. You may go ahead. Caller, please unmute your phone or device. Your line is unmuted. You may go ahead. Hello, this is Robert Hammond. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, Mr. Hammond, good afternoon. Oh, oh, oh yes, ma'am. I'm sorry for the inconvenience there. I submitted a document for a public comment, uh, and I don't know if anybody's had a chance to read it, but uh, first, the first part was the question in the 2016 FOIA um, legislation, it required a single portal for submitting, and I was wondering, I was thinking that might be FOIA online, but I'm not sure, and maybe it's FOIA.gov, but does anybody know what the answer is to that and how that project's coming? Hi. Yes. <laughs> this is Bobby, excuse me. <clears throat> this is Bobby from the Department of Justice. Um, so the, the national FOIA portal that, that was part of the 2016 amendments that is FOIA.gov. Um, FOIA Online is uh, a shared service that agencies could use as their case management system that also has a public-facing portal, um, such the same, similar as other uh, case management systems that are out there that either agencies have built or procured that also may have a public-facing portal. But the intent of the amendments were to have, in addition to that, not to disrupt those, a single place where a requester can go and make a request um, directly from that website to um, any of the agencies uh, subject to the FOIA. Uh, and so we launched that uh, in, um, uh, uh, well, I think 2017 or 18, uh, we launched the national portal on FOIA.gov um, where you can go and each agency has their own landing page 
Um, a key part of the portal is uh, interoperability with the agency's case management systems. Uh, in agencies, we had uh, a directive to agencies, a joint OMV DOJ directive um, that uh, absent an exception uh, being granted that uh, agencies be fully interoperable with the portal by the end of uh, uh, this fiscal year. And we're working with agencies to do that. A lot of agencies are already interoperable. Um, and, and you, when you go to 40.gov, you will see a form, uh, a, a standardized form, but one that's also customized to the agency. Um, where you can um, uh, have uh, submit your request directly to that agency from the portal. We also have a lot of wealth of information about uh, the agency's FOIA program, including their FOIA libraries, um, their average processing time, their FOIA regulations, their FOIA reference handbook. Um, and so, so that is that FOIA.gov is the is the is where the national FOIA portal is. Okay, if I can have just a second to follow up on that. I've used them both. FOIA.gov is basically an API. It connects to somebody else's uh, application. So from a requester's perspective, all that does, it gives you a place to submit your uh, request. FOIA Online, on the other hand, you get a login. It, it pre-records, you know, all the stuff you normally use for a, a FOIA thing. And you can view the status of your request, if it's open, if it's closed, uh, and those sorts of things. And I'm sure you don't have time to address it during the meeting, but I submit, I like FOIA online, I really do, but there are several deficiencies from the perspective of the requester in that, uh, and a couple of those things, the agencies set by default to embargo and make not viewable to the public the, the requester's name, the request itself, and all the correspondence. And that defeats the purpose of the web page. I mean, release to one, release to all. So maybe you guys can get a chance to take a look at the recommended changes that I have for that one, get it to the right committee, and, and hopefully somebody will take a look at that. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just uh, just quickly add on to uh, just uh, that, uh, of course, the, the individual portals agency they're using might have additional functionality, but the idea with the portal is that we'll continuously building on it um, so that we can integrate with agency systems to add additional functionality, such as viewing records and things like that. So uh, the hope, the vision is that eventually um, uh, all the functionality, the functionality of the national portal increases um, to to meet the the type of functionality that's out there for what individual agencies are using for their their portals if they are using the portal. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We do have. A we do have another question in the queue. Sure. Let's go ahead and listen to that caller. All right, very good. Polio line is unmuted. You may go ahead. Hello, this is Alex Howard. Thank you for continuing to hold these discussions during this state of <clears throat> pandemic. I hope that you'll make the recording of this discussion available to the public on the archives YouTube channel as soon as it's feasible, along with the closed captioning described at the beginning to make this public meeting accessible. I asked several questions in the chat uh, prior to when I raised my hand because I wasn't sure if the queue would get to me, but the principal one at the top, I uh, would be grateful if you could address the others, um, regards the suspension of uh, freedom of information law uh, practices and offices across our country. Um, obviously, the folks from the federal government will focus on the agencies, but there are uh, quite a few people from civil society as well. And what we see here on the civil society side is states and city government suspending FOIA during the state of emergency, which has now lasted for nine months. And given the scale of death and disruption gone going right now, we can expect to last into the winter. What should be the stance of agencies with respect to the FOIA? What should be the stance of others? What provisions can be made to ensure that public access to trustworthy information in a pandemic is not cut off, comma, I should say particularly, um, given that we see significant disparities between what 
uh, governors, secretaries, and even presidents say in public and what epidemiologists and public health officials are saying in private. Thank you again for hosting this meeting in a virtual context, enabling us to continue to have these discussions.